So it is my honor and privilege to receive uh, Martin van Dijk for this uh, All of Us seminar. The title of this presentation will be The Coordination of Time in Galileo's Experiments. So we will, you will talk around one hour maximum. After that, we'll take a short break, and there will be a, a comments of Kevin Chalas to start the general discussion. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, merci pour uh, l'invitation. Je parlerai en anglais. C'est plus facile pour moi, peut-être aussi plus facile pour vous, uh, de me comprendre comme il faut. So, the coordination of time in Galileo's experiments, that's the topic of the talk. It will be partly historical, partly more philosophical. But to really properly set the stage, I want to start out with a rather long quote by Galileo describing his most famous experiment so that you know the kind of things that we're talking about. So here it goes. In a wooden beam about 12 braccia long, half a braccia wide, and three inches thick, so let's assume more or less six meters long, so a very long uh, wooden beam, a channel was cut along the narrowest dim dimension, a little over an inch wide and made very straight, so that this would be clear and smooth, there was glued within it a piece of vellum, as much smoothed and cleaned as possible. In this there was made to descend a very hard bronze ball, well rounded and polished, the beam having been tilted by elevating one end of it above the horizontal plane from one to two braccia at will. As I said, the ball was allowed to descend along the said groove, and we noted, in a manner I shall presently tell you, the time that it consumed in running all the way repeating the same process many times in order to be quite sure as to the amount of time in which we never found the difference of even the tenth part of a pulse beat. This operation being precisely established, we made the same ball descend only one quarter the length of this channel, and the time of its descent being measured, this was found always to be precisely one half the other. Next, making the experiment for other lengths, by experiments repeated a full hundred times, the spaces were always found to be to one another as the squares of the times. As to the measure of time, we had a large container filled with water and fastened from above, which had a slender tube affixed to its bottom, through which a narrow thread of water ran. This was received in a little beaker during the entire time that the ball descended along the channel or parts of it. The little amounts of water collected in this way were weighed from time to time on a delicate balance, the differences and ratios of the weights giving us the differences and ratios of the times, and with such precision that, as I have said, these operations repeated time and again never differed by any notable amount." End of quote. So a famous quote and let me immediately uh, round it up with a famous commentary on that uh, specific quote. A bronze ball in a smooth polished wooden groove, a vessel of water with a small hole through which it runs out and which one collects in a small glass in order to wait afterwards and thus measure the times of descent. The Roman water, water clock, that of Stasebius, had been already a much better instrument. What an accumulation of sources of error and inexactitudes. It is obvious that the Galilean experiments are completely worthless. The very perfection of their results is a rigorous proof of their incorrection. So, of course, Alexandre Coiré doubting the epistemic value of the experiment, and let me add the last sentence of the paper in, in, from which I've taken this quote. Not only are good experiments based upon theory, but even the means to perform them are nothing else than theory incarnate. So, of course, Coiré is making his point of, of skepticism or is expressing his skepticism with respect to the value of Galileo's experiment because he wants to make a very specific point about what it takes to set up good experiments. And you can only get good experiments if you already have good theory. So theory cannot start by experiments, that's having 
uh, things the other way around. So that's the main uh, message that, that, that Koire wants to drive home. Now, I think there are actually two points hidden in Koire's criticism. The one is the one that's most often focused on, that has to do with the problem of idealization, okay, where he's, he's stressing that, well, smoothly polished, yeah, yeah, all well, but, but the results will never be as perfect as Galileo claims them to be. So Galileo is clearly exaggerating for rhetorical reasons. But apart from the problem of idealization, there is also the problem of coordination. In the, the specific sense, what reasons does Galileo actually have to think that he's measuring something like time? So even if the, the situations were as ideal as you would like them to be, is he actually measuring the time of descent using this apparatus, this water clock? To, to, to what extent does Galileo have good reasons to, to think that he's actually measuring time in the absence, of course, of a theory that would tell him that indeed he is measuring time in these <coughs> circumstances. So that's where the problem of coordination comes in. So uh, what I will do in my talk, I will first go a bit further, uh, giving some background on this, this philosophical idea of the problem of coordination, which uh, of course has a rather well-known history within the philosophy of science of the, the 20th century. Uh, I'll use that to then go back to Galileo's research program to, to, to have a look at, at some of the temporal developments within Galileo's research. I will then pay attention to one very specific experiment that he carried out and, and that we have the, the manuscript notes uh, where Galileo noted down his results. It's not the experiment that we started out with, but it's one related to it. I'll then uh, introduce Huygens' work on the pendulum, and this is actually also uh, something that's put at center of stage by Quare in his paper on Galileo. So, so I'm, I'm actually following Quare uh, there, and I will then end with some concluding remarks if time permits. So let me first go to this problem of coordination. And uh, I think at least in, in it's, it's not the general ID, but calling it uh, an, an issue of coordination is, is most commonly uh, related to Hans Reichenbach, who uh, spent quite some time in his work on the theory of relativity and a priori knowledge, one of the uh, key texts in Reichenbach's own development from a neo-Kantian view on science to what then will become his logical empiricist analysis of science, where he introduces the problem uh, in the following terms. The physical object cannot be determined by axioms and definitions. It is a thing of the real world, not an object of the logical world of mathematics. Offhand, it looks as if the method of representing physical events by mathematical equations is the same as that of mathematics. Physics has developed a method of defining one magnitude in terms of others, by relating them to more and more general magnitudes and by ultimately arriving at axioms, that is, the fundamental equations of physics. Yet, what is obtained in this fashion is just a system of mathematical relations. What is lacking in such a system is a statement regarding the significance of physics, the assertion that the system of equations is true for reality. And it's, of course, the latter part that must be somehow given by something like a coordination. But the basic problem there, the basic problem that, that exercised Reichenbach, is that you cannot assume that this reality already has mathematical structure, but if it does not yet has, have mathematical structure, how are you going to relate a mathematical structure to something that is not mathematically structured? That is the basic problem that, that, that Reichenbach was dealing with. Now, and in these general terms, pro probably or possibly, not something that can be easily solved, because it's really set up as a dilemma, either mathematical or not mathematical. And if it's already mathematical, the coordination has already happened. And if not mathematical, how are you going to ever do a coordination? So that's the, that's the basic form of the, the problem. 
Now, in the way that, that Reichenbach sets up the problem and the way that he's going to think about ways of solving it, uh, there, there's a lot in the background, but one uh, philosopher that's, that's clearly very important is Poincaré. And uh, Poincaré, uh, his analysis specifically of space and time and, 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 and the questions that are raised once you start thinking about exactly these, these kinds of questions. So let us first uh, go back to this, this paper by Poincaré from uh, originally 1898 and let's see uh, how Poincaré introduces this for the issue of time. Time on the one hand as a mathematical parameter as it is present in physical theories and on the other hand time as a physical thing or a process, something that we are somehow trying to measure. Now, the first basic point that Poincaré makes in, in the paper uh, can be summarized uh, with the following sentence. Nous n'avons pas l'intuition directe direct de l'égalité des deux intervalles de temps. We, we, so the, the, the basic problem is going to be how are we ever going to know that two temporal uh, intervals have the same length? Because, of course, you, you can have an experience of time passing, and that's the kind of experience we have, of time passing, but you cannot, as it were, keep the time that has already passed present and then compare it with the time that is passing now. So there is no direct access in our kind of experience, for the experience that we have, we don't have access to equality of temporal intervals. So that's, that's the, the, the basic form of the problem. Now Poincaré goes on by telling a little story of how physicists nonetheless have tried to, to deal with temporal processes. And the, the basic starting point is, okay, you cannot have a direct intuition, a direct experience of this equality, but you can define things as being equal. And so it starts by choice, and they were, of course, uh, heading uh, the direction for some kind of conventionalism. What physicists do is that they freely choose a certain kind of physical process as exhibiting um, equality of time. Not because you know that they are equal, not because you can experience that they can be equal, but because you have to start somewhere and you define them to be equal. And what better choice than to use a pendulum for this? Why, why a good choice? Well, because it is a repeating process. So that's one thing that's, of course, interesting. It repeats itself. So it is kind of plausible to then call two subsequent uh, patterns as being equal in time. And the second thing is, of course, that you can take different pendulums and, and, and compare them with each other. And at least you can say if the two pendulums are of the same length, that they do this at the, for each swing. They keep they are synchronous with each other. So there are a few reasons why it is a good choice. It makes sense to pick this as your definition for equal time. It makes sense, but there are a number of problems. The number of problems having to do with the fact that you will start realizing that the behavior of this pendulum is also dependent on factors such as temperature and, and friction. And so if you are start to take into account that there are a number of disturbances that will also uh, determine how a pendulum behaves, then you will start wondering whether the choice was actually a good choice. And this drives you to, towards a second phenomenon in Poincaré's retelling, and this is astronomical phenomena. You're going to define equal time by an other periodic phenomenon you can notice in nature, the day-night uh, pattern as it is uh, uh, caused by the rotation of the Earth. But again, similar worries will arise if this is really a rotating system and if you have the sea on it and the sea 
is, is not strictly following the rotation, then there will be co there, there are causes that will again uh, intervene and, and, and make this phenomenon probably not strictly uh, isochronous, and so on and so on. This brings um, Poincaré then to the second main point of the first half of the paper. So what physicists in the end will actually do <coughs> is turn this around and say le temps doit être défini de telle façon que la loi de Newton et des forces vives soit vérifiée. So what you're gonna say and what you're actually already implicitly doing, so let's go back to what I said, so there will be other causes and because of these other causes the, 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 the motion will not be strictly uniform. Well, how do you know that there are other causes and that they will have the, this effect? Well, basically because you have these laws of Newton that tell you something like this. And this means that you're already actually using time as it is present in the formulation, as a theoretical parameter in the formulation of the laws of Newton, as your implicit criterion for equality of time in physical phenomena. So the, the, the definition of time is not so much, so in, in the first step you want to define time by picking, a ran not a random, by smartly picking, uh, cleverly picking a phenomenon that can define equality of time. In the second step you're going to say, oh, let's not define it by a specific phenomenon, let's define it by these general laws and then let's look at which phenomena according to these laws take equal time. Again, Poincaré corrects himself by noticing, well, wait a second, if this is the case, then of course, if we would do a mathematical transformation on this parameter of time, Newton's laws are empirical laws, they would remain true, but they would only get a more complicated formula. So the, the final conclusion is, how is time being defined by physicists well, le temps doit être défini de telle façon que les équations de la mécanique soient aussi simples que possible. So, how are um, physicists defining time? Again, you, you cannot experience it, so you, you have to define it. Well, the, the, the proper definition is, however, uh, whatever the, 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 it is, it must be such that the laws that we will come up with are the, the, the simplest laws that we can formulate. So that's uh, Poincaré's analysis in this, this famous uh, paper, which of course is, is, is particularly famous because the second half of the paper that really goes into problems having to do with simultaneity and, and uh, leads into the kind of considerations that are also behind uh, Einstein's uh, work a few years later. Now, I want to, uh, before going back to the, to the, the Galileo case, and, and let's look how Galileo was actually making these kinds of choices, because that's more or less the agenda for the talk. Let's, let's, let's see actually how historically uh, physicists have been dealing with this problem, how they have been picking the right kinds of phenomena to instantiate something like uniform time. Before go do, doing that, I want to um, add one uh, philosophical commentary uh, and, and I'm taking it from Bas van Vlaassen's book on scientific representation, uh, which has one chapter devoted to the problem of coordination, where it starts with Reichenberg, goes to Poincaré, so in, in a sense I've been uh, just summarizing also what, what he uh, is doing there. But he's doing it to make a specific point. And the specific point is the following. Poincaré oversimplified by suggesting that it is mainly a matter of submitting definitions in such a way so as to keep theory as simple as possible. And this is a point that in a way is also already made by Einstein, as Van Vlaassen himself points out, that, that Poincaré's story is a bit too simple and on the one hand you have theory, on the other hand you have the definitions and the definitions are freely chosen such as and, and 
The main reason why this is, is too simple, according to Van Fraassen, is that measurement practice and theory evolve together in a thoroughly entangled way. So Poincaré is singling out, and, and that's of course what, what, what Einstein is doing, saying, oh, but you, Poincaré is, is pretending that we need to keep Newton's axioms fixed and then we define such that, but Einstein's point is why keep these fixed? That you can make the choice at other points as well. And uh, Van Fraassen is agreeing, but turning this again in a historical point, measurement practice and theory evolve together in a thoroughly entangled way. Somewhat hesitantly, one might say that the measured parameter or at least its concept is constituted in the course of its historical development. Choices are made, and once made, may encounter resistance, whether in experiment or in theory writing, or more usually in combination of the two, or else be vindic vindicated by smooth progress on both fronts. So it's the measurement and practice, uh, measurement practice and theory evolve together in a thoroughly entangled way that I'm going to use as my red thread in the rest of my talk by trying to lay bare this kind of historical process where questions about how to measure and questions about what theoretical ideas to hold true were thoroughly entangled. You cannot just say, oh, here's a choice and there's a theory. No, the two were developing uh, at the same time. So that's, that's the, the, the perspective I'm going to take and I'm going to look at the development of Galileo's research program and I think it, it makes sense to call it a research program in the sense that there is a rather systematic set of questions that Galileo is tackling and is coming back to and is rethinking based on new experimental findings, new theoretical uh, explorations. And the first step in this systematic program uh, takes place somewhere in the years between 1589-1592, at the moment that Galileo is a young professor of mathematics at the University of Pisa, and he sets out to develop something like what he calls the mathematical natural philosophy. So he's going to ask the questions that the natural philosophers are asking, but he's going to answer them in a different way, and the different way is basing himself on mathematics. After all, he's a professor of mathematics. And the first uh, and the, the, the main central idea of the treatise as he writes it, and we only have the manuscript, so he, he is dissatisfied with the result himself. There are a number of reasons why he never decides to publish it, he rewrites it and then at a certain point drops uh, the work. But the main, or the, the, probably the most central idea, is where he said the speed of falling bodies proportional to the difference in specific weights of on the one hand the body and on the other hand the medium. So Aristotelian natural philosophers have been debating questions about so what's, what's the cause behind the speed of a falling body and, and what are the factors that we should take into account. And Galileo's main idea is to look at this as basically a problem in Archimedean hydrostatics. And Archimedean hydrostatics gives you a criterion for whether a body will go down in a medium, will stay in equilibrium or will move up. That's basically what it tells you, and it tells you to, 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 to find out which of these three measure the weight of the body and measure the vo an equal volume of the medium, its weight, and, and depending on uh, which is the, 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 the greatest that determines the direction of the motion. Galileo adds this extra hypothesis that this difference in this weight actually also gives you a measure for the speed of the falling bodies. Second uh, idea that he treats in the treatise is the speed of bodies descending on an inclined plane. And there he's going to set it again proportional to effective weight. So he's, he's seeing a similarity between the problem of descent in a medium 
part of the weight of the body is taken away by the medium and the, the, the problem of descent on an inclined plane, again, part of the weight of the body is actually taken away by the uh, inclined plane. And this is the kind of diagram he has. Uh, the details don't matter, but so he, he can mathematically determine the effective weight of the body on the inclined plane and then uh, set the speed proportional to, to this effective weight. And third central conceptual idea is the idea that impressed forces expand out of themselves. So they die out. So, and this is on the one hand related to the problem of the trajectory of a projectile. So again, this is the kind of, of, of picture he draws. So if you throw a ball, the first part of the trajectory is being determined by the fact that you have impressed a force a force in a certain direction on the ball, but gradually this force will start extinguishing, it will decay. And at the moment that, that it's decaying, the weight of the body comes in as a second factor. So the, 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 it starts out more or less rectilinear and then it will, will, will start going on this more or less circular uh, part until this impressed force is completely extinguished and then the weight of the body takes over and you again have something like a free fall. Now this idea of the impressed force is, 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 and, and, and its decay is important for a number of both historical and conceptual reasons, but it is particularly important because Galileo can appeal to this to justify the fact that he treats free falling bodies as having a uniform speed. Because, of course, experience suggests that if a body falls and if, if you let it uh, drop from a high tower, you will start noticing this, that this body is actually accelerating throughout its fall. So, whereas his, his kind of, his mathematics of free fall suggests it should be uniform. But uh, the, 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 the answer he has to this observation is that, yes, that's true, but you must ask yourself, before the body was falling, it was not falling because you were holding it up. And you were, the fact that you were holding it up means that you were impressing a force on it to keep it up. Once you let it go, the impressed force is still present, but it's slowly, slowly decaying. And it is because it's decaying that you observe an acceleration. That's actually the body that's going towards its actual speed and it reaches this speed uh, as given by the formula at the moment that the impressed force has completely expanded itself. So that's the kind of, of, of overall coherence of how these different ideas hang together. Now, there's much to be told about, about the treaties and the concepts he uses, but the main point that's important for my story is that time itself is never mathematized. It's not treated as being something like a mathematical parameter. Galileo hardly talks about time. He does, but, but it's not, not the topic of his treatise. He's talking about speeds. And speeds have to do with times, but there is, there is no point where he's attempting a mathematization of time itself. And you, you, you can even, in, in, to some extent, see him doing the opposite. Yeah, so so you, you're, you're talking about speeds, Galileo, how are you going to measure <coughs> speeds? Isn't that a question you would want to ask, be a mathematician, how are you going to measure speeds? Well, he has an answer. Measure the specific weights, and that gives you the speeds. So the only way he is implicitly mathematizing time is by doing away with time. So that's, that's I think, important about this early stage uh, in, in his research program. Okay, let's now go to the second step. And this is uh, dated 1592, more or less the moment he drops work on the De Motu Treaties, maybe because of what we will see now, probably also because of a number of other reasons. And it's, it's linked to the move uh, from, uh, from Pisa to Padua. So Galileo gets a better position, again, as professor of mathematics at the University of Padua. And on the way to uh, Padua, he drops by his friend Guido Baldo del Monte, a mathematician as himself, but more experienced, who was actually instrumental in uh, getting Galileo the position in Padua. And they carry out an experiment together. And this is from 
uh, Guido Baldo's notebook. And you see here the setup of the experiment. They basically uh, take, it, it's, it's, you can see this as a roof. And you take a ball, you, t uh, you ink it. So you have, you have uh, ink, you, you ink the ball, and then you throw it over the inclined plane of the roof. And you look at the trajectory that uh, it leaves. Trying to answer this question that was already there, what, what is the shape of the projectile motion? Now, I'm here basing myself on, on, on a paper from 2002, I think, by Jürgen Ren, Peter Damerov and Simon Rieger, uh, who really go into quite a lot of circumstantial evidence that, that really nails the case, because up till then, people sometimes mentioned this manuscript by Guido Baldo, but, but they really show that we really should see this as joint work by Guido Baldo and Galileo. <coughs> and they also stress that initially the main thing that, that Guido Baldo and also Galileo take away from this experiment is that the curve of the projectile is symmetric. Remember again the kind of, of explanation I gave in the demotive first is more or less rectilinear because of the impressed force is dominating, then it becomes more or less circular because you have a mixture of impressed force that is decaying and the weight, and then the weight is, is taking over. And that suggests, if you talk about it in this way, this suggests an asymmetric curve, and that's how Galileo uh, draws it. Here they have observational evidence with a, with a very smart experiment with, with the inked ball that shows that the curve is more or less symmetric. And that's the main point that Galileo takes away. If, if we want to understand how this decaying force, etc., is, is in, uh, intermingling with the weight of the body, there is a symmetry involved. Even more, they note that the curve could or looks like a parabola. They, the, the nodes don't say it is a parabola, but it says oh, it, it, it very much looks like a parabola, which for our, uh, from our perspective is of course very suggestive because once you see the projectile motion as parabolic, you basically have Galileo's law of fall because law of fall states that the distances are as times squared. And that's exactly the kind of form that a parabolic curve will give you. But, again, nowhere in the early notes does Galileo draw this conclusion. And this, I think, is related to the fact that, again, at this point, he has not linked this mathematical curve to time as a mathematical parameter. You're only going to read the law of fall in the parabolic curve if you're able to read the other, the horizontal uh, component, as being a uniform time. And because only then, of course, do the x and the y ordinates give you uh, uh, distances as squares of times. So for us, it's very easy to read it into it, but you can only read it into it if you have identified one of the two uh, ordinates as, as being a time parameter. And there is no evidence at all that Galileo initially is, is looking at it in that way. So we have something that, looking back, will become important in, in, in linking time as a mathematical parameter to empirical phenomena, because here, here you have something that allows you to coordinate so the, the, this, 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 this inked uh, trajectory is an instance of a coordination of time as a mathematical parameter with an empirical phenomena, but only, of course, once you have defined time as being this mathematical parameter, and that Galileo has not done yet at this point. This brings us to a third stage. Third stage that can be, again, rather uh, confidently dated to the year 1602, so 10 years later, uh, Galileo is still professor in mathematics at uh, Padua. And here I'm going to base myself uh, mainly on, on this book that, that came out a few years ago, uh, Swinging and Rolling, Unveiling Galileo's Unorthodox Path from a Challenging Problem to a New Science, 
by Jochen Butter, actually PhD student uh, of, of Jürgen Renn, and who really for the first time has given a well-grounded assessment of all the manuscript material that Galileo left. So there is a, a, a huge, fol a huge uh, codex uh, of, of, of folios with experimental notes taken by Galileo, but yeah, it's, 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 it's really disparate notes, a note on this, a note on that, a calculation, a diagram, and over the years people have given interpretations of isolated notes and if you just take one manuscript note in isolation, you can give it almost any interpretation you like. And what Budner has done is really bottom up, starting from all the folios and putting them all next to each other and seeing where do things recur, etc. He has bottom up, I think, made the best case possible for, okay, this is what the manuscript evidence actually teaches us about Galileo's work, what he was doing in mainly 1602 and a few years after that and, and, and how, how these, uh, what were the developments that these manuscript notes uh, bear trace to. And basing, uh, so, so looking at, at Butner's findings, in 1602 Galileo assumes a new phenomenon that the pendulum has a property of isochronity. So that if, if I take one pendulum uh, with a certain length and I release it from a certain height, it will, will uh, start swinging. If I take a second pendulum of the same height, uh, the same length, but I release it from a different height at the same time, they will keep on swimming, swinging together. Even if the one is, 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 is doing this, and the other is doing this, they will keep on doing this together. So that's the basic property of the isochronity of the pendulum that Galileo is now suddenly interested in. Not only that, he assumes a second thing. He assumes that motion on inclined planes inscribed in a circle also show this property of isochronity. So if you take a circle and you describe a chord, and you describe a second chord in the same circle, and you release the ball on the first chord and on the second chord at the same moment, they will reach the lowest point at the same time. Second property assumed by Galileo. And the third one is the law of fall. So uh, what Butner's analysis shows is that this is the starting point for these manuscript notes. So it's the, the notes are not going to show us how Galileo came to these, but once he has these ideas, suddenly he starts, <coughs> starts doing something new. Now, we can say a few things on how Galileo probably would have come to these uh, properties. The first, the pendulum. So this, uh, remember, was the, the, the diagram I showed you that Galileo used to determine the effective weight of bodies on inclined planes. But it's of course very suggestive that, 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 that if, if the, the circle is here purely for mathematical reasons. Initially, the circle has no physical interpretation. It's, it's just mathematically there, but what, what he's looking at is actually um, a balance with a, a bent arm. But if you, if you do this for a few different positions, Mathematically, the circle will show up as kind of a, a useful diagrammatic feature. But in uh, around 1600, probably just, just before starting this set of notes, Galileo writes a treatise on mechanics. Mechanics as in the old idea as being the theory of simple machines, where he again includes this treatment of the effective weight of bodies on, on uh, inclined planes. And there he adds, well, it doesn't actually matter if, if, you're, if the ball is, is here on an inclined plane or if it would be in a circle. So it's, it, here the effective weight of the body going down on this inclined plane or if you would consider a body going down in a circular hoop, at this point it would have the same effective weight. So here he starts wondering or he starts suggesting that this circle also can be giving a physical interpretation. 
that's of course the point where you're actually thinking about the pendulum. So here we have at least one point where the pendulum comes in as a possible object of interest in its own right. And this then can be connected with the second fact, the isochronity of motion on inclined planes inscribed in a circle. Because these inclined planes here are outside the circle, so the circle, they are actually tangent to the circle, but again, geometrically, you can also put this inclined plane in the, in the circle as a chord. And geometrically, the, the, there is a relation between uh, what he has for the speeds on the inclined planes and the speeds inscribed on the uh, on the chords inscribed in the circle. So, on the one hand, these kind of diagrams suggest that the pendulum might be an interesting object in its own right, and at the same time, they suggest that there might be a relation between this specific property of the pendulum that then shows up. Once you start looking at the pendulum, this is something well, you will, you will rather easily start noticing, well, that the motion on inclined planes do in themselves show a related property. And this is what really is the challenge that sets off Galileo's work in these manuscripts, because then you can start uh, trying to construct the motion on the circular arc, such as the motion of a pendulum, by these inclined planes. So you're going to try to see whether you can actually demonstrate, and that's really the challenge that Galileo sets himself, whether you can demonstrate the isochronity of the pendulum based on motion on inclined planes. And this is where the law of fall comes in, because then you need to know how bodies behave on, on, uh, on inclined planes on the one hand, and on the other hand, you know that they must have an accelerated motion. If the isochronic can be demonstrated from motion on inclined planes, you must assume these motion on inclined planes to be accelerated. You can no longer assume them to be uniform. And it's again rather easy to see why this must be the case. So imagine we have a, a ball going down like this. We have the second ball going down like this. And Whatever their speeds, there must be something about it, because you could also take a third one going down from here. There must be something in how they accelerate that is responsible for this isochronity. So the acceleration cannot be something extra. No, it must be essential, actually, to the, to the phenomenon. And this is where he, it's in, in this context that he most probably uh, set up the experiment with the inclined plane that I started with to find out empirically, indeed, is there something mathematically. But, but the important point here is he has a reason to think there must be a mathematical regularity in the acceleration because of the isochronity of the pendulum. And because he thinks that this isochronity of the pendulum has something to do with acceleration on the inclined planes. So you have reason to assume that there must be something mathematical. You set up the experiment and you pick your best possible uh, uh, approximation of a mathematical law being the law of fall. Now, again, as, as Butner works shows, this is the challenge that Galileo tries to solve. Can I uh, demonstrate the isochronity of the pendulum based on the behavior on the inclined planes? And this is actually a failed research program. Galileo doesn't achieve his goal. He could not have achieved his goal for two reasons. One, the pendulum is not isochronous. So it's only approximately isochronous if you take uh, small swings. But if you really take bigger swings, it's not isochronous, even if Galileo believed they should be isochronous. And secondly, um, a rolling ball and a swinging ball Physically, they, they, they behave differently. So there are good reasons why Galileo could not have found what he tried, but it's failed, but fruitful, because actually everything that is in the Discorsi that Galileo published in 1638 is coming out of this research path. So this is again what Butner's book shows, that everything that is in the, in the Discorsi is actually coming out of the attempt to demonstrate the isochronity of the pendulum based on this uh, motion on inclined plates.
Okay, there is one further development and that is taking place again as far as the documentary evidence we have after 1602 and that has to do with this, this, this projectile uh, trajectory. Because now Galileo is already convinced that the law of all holds true. If you now go back to this parabola and look at the parabola, well, then you're going to say, ah, so this parabolic trajectory is the composition of, on the one hand, the accelerated downward motion, and thus the horizontal motion must be a uniform motion. Because you know, have reasons to assume that this is an SS times squared, okay, then mathematically this must be a time parameter. So at this point he's, he's taking this step and, and actually uh, interpreting it as the composition as this uniform neutral motion, well, basically a, a forerunner of, Gal of uh, Newton's inertial principle actually, and then the second accelerated downward motion. So, taking all this together, we see Galileo uh, experimenting with in, uh, inclined planes, with pendulums, with projectiles, and he is now really explicitly thinking of time as a mathematical parameter. Even more uh, specifically, time is a mathematical parameter that is relating these different phenomena to each other. It is only because uh, time is, is, is here. So again, time is here in the pendulum, time is here and time is here. And it's time as a mathematical parameter that is relating this empirically different phenomena to each other. So, going back to Quare's quote, good experiments are based upon theory, well, we can say that, yes, in a way, Quare was right, but Galileo had more theory than Quare could see behind his experiment. In itself, the experiment with the water clock is indeed not a very good experiment. It's not very convincing. Most of Galileo, a lot of Galileo's contemporaries were not convinced. They, okay, yeah, more or less, approximately, yeah, but why, why would we think that this is actually the right mathematical interpretation of your empirical findings? And Quare is taking up on this, this suspicion and, and for good reasons. But Galileo himself had more theory, but failed theory in the sense that Galileo could not theoretically link all these together, but he knew that there were reasons to assume that this might be possible. He had some partial successes in relating these to each other, and it's these partial successes that give him, let's say, a partial theory that Quare was asking for. Now, the second uh, aspect of, of Quare's claim, so good experiments are based upon theory and the means to perform them are nothing else than theory incarnate, we can see um, illustrated, I think, very beautifully in another of uh, these experimental notes taken by Galileo. And this is an experiment uh, on one of these folio 116 verso, and this is the folio. And uh, I'm here basing myself uh, again on, on very beautiful uh, analysis that has been given of this specific uh, experiment by a mathematician Alexander Hahn in uh, 2002. This is the basic setup. So Galileo has an inclined plane that's put on a table. And he releases a ball from different heights. So first from, from this point, then from this point, then from this point. So, and each time, depending on the height, it's going to go down a certain length over the inclined plane. It comes at the bottom, and with the speed that it has um, achieved during its descent on the inclined plane, it will then be projected from the table, and it will uh, then describe a trajectory if, if Galileo is right, a parabolic trajectory, and hit the ground at a certain distance r. Now, what can we learn from putting the height against the distances? Because that's, that's what Galileo is experimentally going to do. He's going to let the ball go from different heights, 
and is then going to look at the distance uh, at which it reaches the ground. Well, first, for purely geometrical reasons, the height is proportional to the length of the descent on the inclined plane. Then, if Galileo's law of fall holds true, these lengths will be as the squares of the times taken for this motion. Now, if, as Galileo also believes, um, uniform acceleration is due to the fact that speeds grow as times, and this is again what he put central in his discorsi, then the squares of the times will be as the squares of these speeds. And then, if Galileo is right that this parabolic trajectory is the composition of a uniform horizontal motion and a downwards motion, well, then, uh, the, the, how far it will go, this, this will be determined by the speed it has, because this speed, the horizontal speed, will be conserved, and so the, the square of this speed will be as the square of, of this distance. And what Galileo is thus testing is whether all these assumptions taken together hold true because he's putting the heights against these distances. Now, this is, as Han points out in his analysis, a much better test, a much more precise test than the test with the water clock, for two reasons. One, the water clock is not strictly uniform, and secondly, with the water clock, one of the, the major source of imprecision in Galileo's experiment is, well, on the one hand, you have to start and stop the water clock, and on the other hand, the ball. So you have to release the ball and open the water clock mm. as closely together as possible, and then close the water clock at the moment that the ball hits the... So that's quite imprecise. Well, both these problems are dissolved <coughs> in this setup. Because Galileo, again, is not measuring time. He's, he's measuring distances. But he, the, me the distances can be put together because time is here the central parameter in this link of proportions. So he has made the measurement of time internal to the setup. He doesn't need to measure time in itself. The, the phenomena against each other uh, can do this. You can actually look at it, at it in two ways. Either you say Galileo is using this, uh, the, the fact that this, this motion is uniform as his definition of time. He's saying, so he's actually saying this, these distances will be as the speeds and the speeds by definition will be as the times. And now let us test whether the distances of the along the inclined planes are as the squares of times. So either he's using this as his clock to test the law of fall, or you can do it, you can look at it in the other way, he's using his law of fall as the definition of time to test whether this motion is indeed uniform. You can look at it in both ways. There are, as it were, two clocks within the experiment. And what I would, would suggest is that we can, we can see what's happening here is that indeed you can choose to define time either in the one way or the other, but the fact that you can do both is here the interesting thing. And this introduces a severe empirical coherence condition. The time in the one and the time in the other, it's the same time. It's the same parameter small t that is showing up again. So this is where I think you can really see this entangled history of the measurement practice and the development of the theory really uh, taking place. So uh, to quote Van Fraassen again, choices are made and ones made may encounter resistance, whether in experiment or in theory writing or else vindicated. And this is where it is being vindicated. It needed not be the case, of course, that this um, distances where as the heights, it turns out to be the case. So the, the, the chosen definition of time 
is a coherent one. It works out. It can be vindicated. It is sensible to stay with this definition and use it to start analyzing further empirical phenomena. And of course, one empirical phenomena, the phenomenon that, that, is, that is at this point still an open problem for Galileo is the pendulum. Uh, because this is what he did not achieve. He did not achieve, so here you see how the projectile motion and the uh, inclined plane are really tightly mathematically coupled to each other. But it's still an open question whether that is the same time as the time that shows up or that seems to show up in the motion of the pendulum. And this is the thing that, that, that then finally Huygens uh, solves. Because Huygens uh, in, 50, in uh, 72, 73, I'm not sure, publishes his Horologium Oscillatorium, where he presents a demonstration that he actually first found out in 1659, where he does what Galileo set out to do but failed to do. Huygens gives a demonstration that indeed from the law of fall, basing himself on Galileo's law of fall, Huygens demonstrates that this implies isochronity. But it does not imply it for a circular pendulum. Huygens, Huygens is able to prove two things, and this is really the, 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 the big success. On the one hand, he proves that a circular pendulum is only approximately isochronous for small swings which is empirically the case. So Galileo extrapolated from this isochronity for small swings towards isochronity in general, and for this reason was criticized by a lot of his contemporaries. Well, Huygens shows that Galileo's own law of fall indeed implies that it's only isochronous for small swings. And he shows for which curve it is isochronous when the, the the pendulum is not swinging according to a circular arc, but according to a cycloid. And this is, of course, the point where we really reach Quare's conclusion. And, and, and this is why Quare is, 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 is pointing to Huygens as the, the end of the story. The means to perform good experiments are nothing else than theory incarnate. From now on is this pendulum not just a practical timekeeper, in the sense that, as already pointed out by Poincaré in his analysis, okay, yeah, it makes sense for practical purposes to use this as a timekeeper. But Huygens has now shown that it is a good timekeeper for theoretical reasons. That it is in, indeed that if you assume Galileo's uh, mathematical proportions, then the time the time, uh, the, the, the mathematical parameter in S is proportional to times squared, that this time will indeed be uh, periodically uh, kept by the pendulum. Okay, so I'm more or less uh, an hour uh, gone. Let me just add one concluding remark. So I have concluding remarks, but let me just give one because that really then closes the circle and lets us go to Newton. So what Huygens has, has, has shown is that from now on the, the motion of the inclined plane, the projectile, the pendulum are all mathematically related. They all belong to the same mathematical framework and allow you then to, to have uh, a good measure uh, to, to see this physical instrument, this physical thing, the pendulum, as being a timekeeper, as being a very good, as being almost perfect timekeeper. One thing that's interesting about the pendulum, and already Galileo was doing this, is that you can synchronize it with astronomical time. You can start counting how often the pendulum goes up and down, up and down, during 24 hours defined astronomically. So at least, again, practically, you can synchronize the pendulum with the astronomical clock. This, of course, suggests that the time, this astronomical time, must be somehow also related to this time as a mathematical parameter. 
And that's, of course, what Newton then sets out to prove. Newton really takes the step of adding one further phenomenon and showing that the same time small t mathematical parameter is actually the time as measured um, astronomically. And what's really interesting and, and, and interesting for deep, deep reasons is that Newton can only do this by basing himself on the measurements with the pendulum of the constant of acceleration. So what, what, what Newton really, what, what allows him to demonstrate the law of universal gravity and thus to show that, that these astronomical phenomena are again due to the fact that they are the same kind of mechanical system is because he can compare the acceleration of a body on the Earth with the acceleration of the Moon. And that's the famous Moon test, which was only possible because this pendulum had indeed become theory incarnate and allowed this highly successful coordination of uh, mathematical time and uh, empirical phenomena. So that's where I will end. Thank you. Let's take five and after that break a general discussion. Thank you.
So, before the general discussion, let's now do the comments. So, Kevin Charas, one of our PC candidates, will do a brief comment to open the discussion. <laughs> comment or questions? Yes, thank you very much for the talk, uh, very illuminating. Um, it's, it's always hard to, to get back from the contemporary physics settings to the historical ones. But one thing that I found very interesting is how this is different from the medieval uh, mathematician of, of motion that's happened just before Galileo's times, and how back before Galileo's uh, motions were mathematized, mathematized and time was always part of motion, it was never separated, never done as this mathematical parameter. So we should show quite, quite well how we, we are getting away from medieval physics and Einstein physics. W one of the questions I had the, was, um, it seemed to me that uh, the way that mm, uh, Gale described motions, it doesn't seem to be uh, that far away from the idea of natural motions, from Einstein natural motions. Does he actually say something about that? Does he, does he explicitly say that he's going uh, away from the idea of natural against non-natural motion, motions, or is it still in this kind of high studian settings? So one of the questions I would have. You want me first to go into the answer or? As you wish. Okay, well. Oh, do, do the first, the other questions and then I'll, uh, yeah. Okay, and so I think we have a question, but it's, it's, I think it's a question that I also have for, for Anne Frassen's uh, passage, as you say, because I, I, I'm always surprised, I was surprised when I read this, uh, this uh, Anne Frassen's book, that uh, Isaac Cheng is only uh, referenced once in the footnotes, because this idea of uh, time setting and dynamical devices being set by with iterative processes, processes seems to be very similar to the thing that Isaac Chang has been describing about inventing temperature. And if it's if, it, if the analogy holds, I wonder if you can have the same ontological um, uh, results and the consequences of time being maybe not something that is actually very out in the world, but something that could be created. And maybe if, if it is the case, maybe we should maybe revise our metaphysics of time <laughs> in, a very, in a more conventional way or less uh, natural way. So what does me, uh, do you think the anal analogy holds? Yeah. That's yeah. Really my second question. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, the first question on the relation, let's say, to the Aristotelian and medieval analyses of motion is, is a good one I want that I consciously stayed away from here. Because if, if you read the De Motu, so the initial treatise that Galileo writes in between 1589 and 1592, that's really in conversation with these debates. So he's really, so on the one hand, he's saying, okay, let's treat motion as not being caused by the kind of causal <coughs> factors that the Aristotelian think, but caused by weight and weight understood as Archimedes understood, understands it as something that can be measured on a balance and that has and that, that then in relation to volume gives rise to something like specific weight. So let's change the causal infrastructure, but let's then see what this what kind of physics arises from this. And initially, and so I said Galileo rewrites it, and the, the interesting thing, it's really fascinating to go through how Galileo rewrites his own treatise, is, has exactly to do with his questions of natural motion. So initially, he tries to speak as much Aristotelian as possible. So in the sense, oh, you have natural motion, you have violent motion, and, and lightness and heaviness, so he tries to keep as much as possible of the Aristotelian vocabulary, at least, but gives it a different flavor. And he comes to some problems there. It doesn't really work out so well because on the one hand, he keeps on talking about natural motion upwards and lightness, but now it's actually not just, it's not really light. It just means that uh, the medium is denser than the body. So he's trying out, but there you really see him struggling with this framework of natural motion or uh, uh, forced motion, and then what's already there, the possibility of an intermediary, horizontal motion. So I said, so at 
after 1602, when he goes back to the parabola, he analyzes it as a neutral uniform motion. Well, in the Demotu, he is already talking about horizontal motion as something that's neither violent nor natural. But he doesn't see it as uniform yet. Because again, time, it's, 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 it's not asking, the, it's, he cannot really say, say much more about it. So, but he's clearly struggling with, with uh, how to do, how to square his Archimedean uh, causal structure with this conceptual structure of motion on a cosmic scale, let's say. Afterwards, after uh, the developments, after that he decides that, uh, that, that the, the natural fall is accelerated, etc., he keeps on calling this natural motion. And when he writes the dialogue and the discourse, he keeps on using the terminology of natural motion, but it, it, the link with the Aristotelian meaning has become very tenuous. So there I think you see him drifting away more and more from what his concept meant, but still for Galileo, a physics must use these terms of natural motion. And, and so it's, it's, it's the... It's, it's not just motion as a state, no, there is something like natural motion, but what actually is meant by calling it natural is becoming rather ambiguous, uh, or more and more ambiguous, I would say, because the, the cosmic, the relation between the, the mechanical and the cosmic has become more a problem than, than something that he can assume. So I think that's, that's for the first and the second, yeah, so the, uh, the relation between Van Fraassen and Hazok Chang, that's a very good, uh, some, and I think a lot of people have the same experience when they read that chapter and, and Galileo to, and uh, Van Fraassen talking a lot on, on, on the problem of temperature actually as an example of this kind of, uh, so I'm slowly going back to the Van Fraassen quote, that, that there is the question like, if, why, why doesn't he, I think for Van Fraassen, so he has this, this one footnote and I think Van Fraassen would say, yeah, yeah, Shang does this much better than I do, in the sense, historically, much, much more. I think the reason why Van Fraassen likes to go back to Mach is that Van Fraassen really wants to put all these ideas in a strongly empiricist tradition. So what Van Fraassen rhetorically, I think, wants to do is say, yeah, Hazok Chang, that's, that, that's good, that, that, that's convincing. But in a way, that's just an update of Mach. And, and so he really wants to push, so he really wants to put this in a very specific kind of tradition. I think it's a nice provocation. Um, but I do think that it's more or less everything that Hazok Chang does with uh, the iterative uh, procedure is is this is the practice and te measurement <coughs> practice and theory evolve together in a thoroughly entangled way and i also think that yes indeed this has implications for how we understand the the status of the thing being measured in the sense that we cannot be naive realists about it this is why van Fraassen again here goes on with somewhat hesitantly <laughs> one might say that the measured parameter is constituted so he's not committing himself to this kind of neo-kantian vocabulary but he's saying well probably if you want to make sense of of the status of this kind of thing this is it's it's constituted but it's constituted in a historical so i would say it's, it's kassir so i have an other uh, claim that Van Fraassen in scientific representation is reinventing Kassir, actually. But with, again, an empiricist bent. But, uh, so yes, and, and I, I, I do believe that this indeed has this kind of implications for the possible metaphysics of time, for example. That um, you cannot think of, so the only way that we know that we are measuring time when we are measuring time is, is because it's coming out of this kind of historical process and there is we cannot step out of this we cannot step out of the practices of 
on the one hand measuring, on the one other hand theorizing, to then say, ah, and that we've actually measured this time with a big T or something like this. There's no room for that. So I would, yeah, I would see that as a, the implication. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now the floor is open. Uh, thanks, Martin. Um, that was great. Uh, so I'm wondering about the notion of theory here. Um, so at some point you said something that made me think twice about this, something like he had a partial theory in the back of his mind. So this means that theory has to be taken as something very far from mathematical theory or something like that, with axioms that are well specified and so on. It's almost implicit. Uh, like, where is the... Like, if we say that measurement and, and, and theory go together, if we try to get that time, um, is it just like theory in a very evolved way, like almost like an axiomatic theory, or do we also have to take into account implicit concepts, uh, uh, I don't know, even storytelling maybe that has been around these concepts before and is more like uh, syntactic than, um, than about reference or whatever. Um, so, so where are the boundaries and does it make a difference for our concept of time uh, and how do you see this notion of theory? Yeah. And how does Van Frassen see it? Yeah. That he's write something like this. Yeah. So, so Van Frassen, to start with him, uh, makes the distinction uh, in in this chapter. So you can always look at this kind of entangled history in two ways. You can look at it from within the history. So when you're struggling, trying to come up with ways to actually make something measurable and at the same time develop the theory about the thing that you're trying to make measurable and you can look backwards from the vantage point where this has been successfully stabilized where questions about measurement you don't need to ask them anymore you know how to measure right. so you after Newton you know how to measure time you have these instruments, they are measuring time for you, and based on these measurements, you're going to do other interesting stuff. And looking back from that vantage point, you have the, the, the concept, the thing that you're talking about, has become this thing in the theory. The theory tells you what it is. Mm -hmm. So, and then you can look back at, at the process that has led towards this being the theory that... that more or less mathematically defines and of course if we here take Newton's Principia as the example that's clearly a mathematical theory it is not uh, an axiomatic system as, as, as we would think of an axiomatic system in, 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 in modern data mathematics but it's clearly a mathematical theory that uh, where time is a parameter within the theory and, and that's, that's what time now is. But of course, what I, why I talk then about um, a partial theory is because Galileo is convinced that there must be a theory, mm -hmm. but he hasn't found it. So that, that's what I expressed a, a bit clumsily with a partial theory. He has, uh, as proportional to times squared, he can do some mathematical manipulations on it using theory of proportions. He can say, oh, if it's on this inclined plane, that inclined plane, he can do... He has a theory there. And he believes, he strongly believes, that this theory must be extendable such that it would also demonstrate things about the pendular motion. Is this a belief? I mean, it's a uh, conviction. It's a conviction. It's a strong conviction that this must be possible because it's based, I think, basically on the fact that isochronity shows up both. Uh, so the isochronity of the chords and of the pendulum, that's for him too striking to ignore. Mm -hmm. 
And even when he doesn't achieve the goal, even when he's not able to demonstrate the one from the other, he keeps on suggesting that there is a relation. Right. So there, there, I think we're really in, this, in the midst of things where there, Galileo thinks there must be somewhere out there a theory that, that, that will do this. And I have some of the building blocks, but I cannot put them together yet. Right. Um, but, this, yeah. Sorry. No, no, no. Um, this makes me think a bit, it's maybe too far beyond uh, Galileo, but uh, it, it's, I asked this question, like, is this belief, and you said it's conviction, but it makes me very much think of, of just like the practice of developing a, a theory, uh, as, as we all do it uh, to some extent, uh, uh, as researchers, we have these hunches. And we actually, if we really are try to be rational about it and talk to colleagues and so on, we present it as hunches, uh, like all oh, conjectures or hypotheses. Uh, but deep down, <coughs> we feel that it has to be true if we invested in it. Uh, maybe months, I mean, I have this uh, that obsessive tendency to months in a row, uh, like there has to be something there, uh, and, and then work hard on trying to prove it, even though maybe it was wrong. Uh, and I, So it was never a belief at all. Uh, uh, it was a hunch, <laughs> like I'm on the right track, there has to be some, and it felt a little bit like that. Um, I would never call that a belief, not even a conviction, um, and definitely not a theory. Um, so I don't know about Galileo, I don't know almost anything about Galileo, but uh, could you see it in this way too, and, and, and could such hunches uh, and intuitions maybe um, have an impact on how we uh, uh, interpret quite complicated notions like time and, and, and our experiments and so on, uh, uh, even though we have no real epistemic hard uh, commitments there, mm -hmm. it remains anxious. So. Yeah, so I think psychologically the distinction is a fake one, yeah. right? And, and I think what I have been describing in Galileo could very well be described in these terms as well. But I think it's, 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 it's a very deeply held uh, hunch. Right. Yeah? So even if after months and years he does not come to the result, he does not drop the ID. Right. And so he, he can... So he can never prove the isochronity. He thinks he can prove something else. That there is something else that he can prove. He can prove that um, if you take this chord and if you take these two chords, that motion, this motion is going to be quicker than that motion. He can prove that based on his law of fall. And he knows experimentally that the pendulum is even quicker. It's always quicker than this. So this is a very, this is for him, I think, the strongest reason to stay committed to the ID. Mm -hmm. So this is isochronous, this is isochronous, this is faster than that, and this is faster than that. So taking that together, it's, it's for him too striking to give up on the ID. So it is a, a hunch, but one that, that has slightly more commitment right. uh, built into it, I would say. But, uh, and then Galileo is a rhetorician, so he tries to hide where he's, but he knows where, and I think again where, with, with the description of the, so Quare is right that just the experiment that Galileo describes is a rather weak epistemic reason to hold on to the law of fall. I think Quare is completely right. And, and Galileo, tries to hide this behind his rhetoric of more than a hundred times and, and always come out very much true, etc., etc. So he's, he's overselling the point there. But at the same time, he did have something to back up his rhetorical overselling. And this is all these other experiments, the pendulum, etc. But that's not something he could present in these terms. That would not have been convincing for the readers as he imagined them, and maybe for himself even. He, but I think we can make sense of the fact that, that, that there is more going on. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks.
that's that's good though. That gets me to to a question that I wanted to ask because there is sort of something hanging in hanging in the air still that like. So you mentioned, and this is actually something that I know a little bit less about, that Galileo's contemporaries actually didn't, many of them, his, his competitors really didn't see this as a particularly convincing uh, empirical argument, mm -hmm. anyway. Um, so in that sense, I guess, I guess where, where, I, where I'm trying to get to is his motivation then right for presenting things in the way in the way that he does and maybe the answer is just the answer that you just gave which is to say it's, it really is in the end of the day largely rhetorical um, in that sense though maybe maybe a bit paradoxically or a bit against the grain of how it's often presented when it's used as one of these cardinal examples in the history of science it's perhaps a lot less successful as filling the function that Galileo hoped that this that this kind of, of experimental intervention would fulfill. Uh, maybe it's a lot less successful than we often give it credit for being. Um, I don't know, maybe, 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 maybe there's, maybe you, you, you've said what you have to say. You, you're allowed to, if, if you don't yeah. repeat yourself. But. but I think I can fill in some of the historical detail that is in itself interesting. Because I think a lot of his contemporaries were convinced. And also partly because of the rhetoric. And there, but there, I think one example, uh, and I'm basing myself on, on other secondary literature here, is, is uh, that's very interesting, is Marais Mersenne. So he's really a key figure in the network of philosophers and natural, and, and mathematicians and natural philosophers in the first half of, of the 17th century. He's a correspondent of Descartes, but also of the Italians. So, and Mersen, when he first reads Galileo, is convinced. And he sets up the experiment and he says, yeah, yeah, I can, yeah it's, it's, it's pretty good, it's pretty convincing. And then he's communicating with other people, like Descartes and other, some Jesuits. And they are all pointing out, ah, but I have a different law. And it's also plausible. So they're, they're really confronting Mersenne with under determination in practice. So you have, you have these approximate results and you can interpret them as being evidence for Galileo's law of fall. Yes, but you can also inter interpret them as evidence for alternative laws that are being presented. Or you can interpret them as Descartes does. Descartes says there is no law of fall. There is no mathematical law of fall. Because Descartes has metaphysical reasons to, to, to hold this, because weight is due to all these collisions of, with, with uh, the subtle uh, matter, and it's never going to translate in a smooth function. It's, oh, yeah, probably if you hear at circumstances at our earth, it, it's a good curve, it's, to, to put it in, in, uh, in terminology that Descartes, mm -hmm. of course, didn't have. He's saying, he's suggesting to Mersenne, it's a good curve fit, but it's not because there's an underlying law. And Mersenne comes away convinced, saying, yeah, the experiments by Galileo. And I think that's, that, that's really a an, an, an very interesting little story. Yeah. Uh, but at the end, Galileo was, of course, proven right. And not by accident. This is why I think he was proven right, because these hunches he had were going in a direction that, in, in Van Vrasen's terms, he indeed were vindicated in the end. But their vindication is the good term. In the end, they were vindicated. But Mersenne was perfectly right to, to be doubtful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Privilege of Britain. Yeah, I have a, a long question, I'm sorry. Uh, Galileo is, uh, has been a, a problem for me for a long time, and now I have a, a specialist, so I will use it. So, my difficulty is to understand the, what, the, what they understand as time in Galileo, because he's passing from the Aristotle position to, to be the first of, after that, uh, Newton. So, in Aristotle, Time is the quantitative properties of change. And 
one of the problem is coordination in, in, in Aristotle. Is, is biological change the same that motus is blah, 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 and blah, blah. And at the end, there's some fuzzy part of Aristotle saying, oh, yeah, but the spheres, they are constant, everything coordinates to that sphere. We don't know how, but anyway. And with Newton, we have time. Why all clocks are coordinates? Because they all measure something external, the real time. And Galileo seems to be in between. So, so yeah, the pendulum inclined plane, same time, but you know, plants growing <laughs> is it the same? Because he's not he's not yet in a Newton. He's, to my knowledge, he never said that time exists independently of stuff. Who does he? No, no, I'm I'm, I'm wondering. Um, it's a good it's a good question. So. Um, Galileo is, of course, less a metaphysician yeah. than Newton is, um, consciously, mm -hmm. and also by, by a temperament, I guess. Um, Galileo is really a mathematician stepping in the domain of natural philosophy and only <coughs> doing something like metaphysics when forced to by his interlocutors, whereas Newton is, is more of course, not in the Principia or in the Principia only in this general school, I mean, a few places, but, this is, but we know well, Newton had more developed uh, ontological ideas, for example, on time, but also space. I was a bit like hesitating because with respect to space, Galileo is a bit more explicit and there he does seem to more or less naively assume an absolute space. So there is kind of an a tension in Galileo between, on the one hand, the way he's developing relativistic ideas to say, well, maybe the Earth is moving and we just don't notice because motion has all these relativistic features. But at the same time, he assumes that there is like a privileged framework from which to say, ah, and the sun is at rest and the Earth is moving. But he doesn't have any criterion at all. So this is why I'm calling it a, a more or less naive, realist position on space, whereas Newton has a sophisticated... He, he, he not only posits that there is something like absolute space, but he also shows how to empirically make sense of this or determine it, at least up till translation, so that it doesn't work out in the end. But Newton is more sophisticated on this, whereas Galileo just naively assumes that there is, in the end, an ultimate frame of reference that they find space. With respect to time, I'm, I'm wondering whether there are any points, it's a good question, I should go back to the text, where he is coming close to even asking the question of the status of time. Um, but I'm assuming that if he would, he would again make some kind of this naive realist move and saying in the end there is this real time and what I'm doing is, is uh, showing the mathematics of it without really coming to terms with, with, with how the mathematics allows you to, to really get to this one thing. Um, but this, one, one more thing that I can say, and this is tying in closer to my story, is that this is of course the importance of what I mentioned, that the pendulum can be synchronized with time as we experience it in the day-night pattern. So you can, uh, on the one hand, we have this general notion of time as we experience it and as it is present in all these other phenomena, growth, etc., and which basically shows up in day-night and seasons. And there the pendulum allows you to connect the, the thing that Galileo is doing with this time. Because on the one hand, this pendulum is supposed to incarnate the mathematical time. And on the other hand, you can really, and Galileo never did it for 24 hours, but not long after Galileo, the Jesuits uh, are going to do it. They're really setting up a pendulum and keep it swinging for 24 hours and count how many beats it takes, such that you can determine the length of uh, seconds, 
uh, pendulum, but the second is now being defined astronomically. So you can link up this mathematical time with this broader time, even if this broader time in itself is not yet mathematized in the same way. That's, that's what's going to happen with Newton. So that's... But here, I, I, I see your point and I take it, but here, if, if, we, if we buy what you say, that in fact is, uh, is not a metaphysician, which I agree, but he's driven by mathematics. So, so the division of movement between vertical and horizontal, okay, it's a mathematical division, but at the end it's a physical too. You, 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 you claim that, that you fall in the right line, even if the earth <laughs> is turning. So in the pendulum too, there's such a combination. So time is also related to these mathematical division that will have later some kind of uh, metaphysical interpretation. So it's, a, it's a mix of uh, So I don't know. I'm confused. Yeah, but Galileo was confused. And this is going back to the issue of natural violent motion. So Galileo, I, I always see Galileo as someone who on the one hand knew what he didn't know and then tried to hide it. <laughs> so he, 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 he knew that he didn't in the end have a coherent framework to think about natural motion, etc. That he, that he on the one hand had very interesting insights in his local phenomena and again something like a conviction that the global cosmic system should be built up from these elements, but that he couldn't do it. But then he tried to write as if he knew how to do it anyway. So, and, and this is, again, so where a lot of these questions are hand wavy, put under the surface of the text uh, by Galileo, I would say. Yeah. yeah, he's always trying to oversell everything and everything published. Yeah, well, but you you can see this as being uh, some 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 lack of humility, which there was, and, and Galileo probably was quite an arrogant man and, and disliked by many for this reason. On the other hand, there is a good research strategy there, right? He's he's pushing things in and and setting an agenda for people after him, and. Again, he's semi-consciously doing this, setting the agenda. Like, this is, this is what you people coming after me should also be trying to expand on. And I think the, the contrast with Descartes is here very interesting because Descartes has his famous letter to Mersenne where he says about Galileo, he philosophizes better than most because he's doing this mathematical thing. But, there's of course a big but, and, and the problem is that Galileo is no metaphysician, that he's doing all these small local things, that he's having this bottom-up strategy. But in the end, of course, the bottom-up strategy was the winning strategy. So th this is where I think there is something right in, in Galileo's overselling. It's really pointing the way towards a bottom-up strategy. Like, let's do this and let's push it and see how far it gets us rather than doing the top-down Cartesian uh, approach. So, when, uh, the, so, so what, what is then, does he, does he have real commitment to what, what he's selling or is he just merely selling it because it's, it's practically and pragmatically it gets him further? Because I remember that, uh, I remember the paper by, by Musgrave where he discusses the conflict between Galileo and the judge and the church is basically saying, well, you're selling all this stuff about the Copernican system and saying, well, it's based on your empirical results. But obviously, your empirical results is not your explanation, but it's undetermined by your empirical results. So, and at the end of the discourse, according to what Musgrave says, uh, the discourse of the, of the world, of the civil world, he seems to be uh, less confident about what he's, explain, what he's uh, explaining with his empirical data. So, is he really like? Believing what is having a commitment? Yeah, yeah I, I, so it, it's, it's getting us back to is it a hunch or yeah. something stronger? And I do think there, so in, in, the, the, 
in the controversy with the church on the status of Copernicus, you see indeed the same thing cropping up in the sense that Galileo is <coughs> pushing the <coughs> point for Copernicus up till its, its breaking point in the sense that he is trying to present it as possibly demonstrated whereas he very well knew that he could not rule out uh, Tycho Brahe's system. And you see his texts, again, some of the tension surfacing. But there, again, I do think that there is something interesting going on, something more interesting than, oh, he had this conviction and just wanted to hold on and hide the fact that, that Galileo introduces a, an implicit criterion in his letter to, to Christina, which is, I'm making progress. So first, we didn't have any evidence to choose between the world systems. Then my telescope came along. And now we know that Ptolemy cannot be right. And he's right there. But of course, there is still Tycho Brahe versus Galileo versus Copernicus. And there he is, is, is okay, but we cannot rule out that further empirical evidence will be found. And there he then puts his bets on, on the tides, wrongly, in the sense that he tried to push the point that, that, that they were really empirical evidence for the motion of the Earth that could not be uh, squared with uh, an Earth at rest. But I think the more interesting point is that he is making it uh, again into a question of progressing research programs and in the end he is forced in an uncomfortable position by the dialectics of the debate he, he feels that he needs to make a stronger point so on the one hand he only wants to make the point let us continue the research and see where it leads us and on the other hand he is driven by some of the constraints of the debate to, to try to make the point stronger than just that. But there again, I do think that, that there is a rather conscious heuristic motivation having to do with how to develop research through, uh, um, through this kind of historical uh, process. Yeah, you're fine. You're fine. Um, yeah, I would like to push you on the idea that it's bottom up, top down that you use for the Captain Galileo, because, as for example, this this is not clearly just bottom up. It's also this 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 river. clearly getting the Captain right principle of philosophy. You start from first principle, you get to physics. Of course, you do experiments from time to time to check. But, so it's not completely Aristotle, but it's in the same style. But, okay, maybe a, 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 a bottom-up was in vogue, the founding of the Royal Society, and that, but you cannot, you cannot say Newton is bottom-up. I mean, this guy is just a mess, uh, going in all direction, metaphysical consideration, theological consideration, experiments too, yeah, of course, but it's a mixed, and he, he seems to see as you well know, in the two first book of, of uh, especially in the first book of Principia, that mathematics is a way to explore physical possibilities. It's, it's the world can be explored modally by mathematics, which I see Galileo going in that direction, but he's clearly maybe not there. And the cap would say, it makes no sense at all, you're crazy. <laughs> yes. Except you know the mind of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so uh, in what way it's bottom up and yeah. in what way it's top down? Yeah, so saying it's bottom up need not imply that it is a purely inductive approach mm -hmm. okay. to physics or to science. What I mean with, with the contrast between then the top down metaphysical approach and the bottom up approach is that you're only gonna, f once you have the right principles, the good theory, the theory is gonna 
get you all kinds of new stuff that you couldn't get to without theory and that you could not get inductively, purely empirically or whatever. But the question is, how do you find out what the right, the proper principles are? And there I see Galileo as doing this kind of, oh, I have this thing, a pendulum, ah, inclined plane, mm, projectile. And let's see if, if we see these as related to each other according to which, which would be the principles that would allow us to see these as related to each other. And that is the way to find out the right principles. And I see Newton as coming out of that tradition. What he's doing is saying, ah, so you have indeed, if, if these are all the phenomena that must be related, th this is where the three laws come from. They're really Newton's interpretation of all this work done by Galileo and Huygens on all these isolated phenomena. What Newton is doing is saying, oh, so you have the free fall, you have the inclined plane, you have the projectile, you have the pendulum, and you have collision. What are the common principles to, from, from which perspective we can see the mathematics that's in all these phenomena is related? Da, 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 the three laws. So you're coming to the, 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 the insight in the proper principles by looking at these specific phenomena and going up from there. Once you have the right principles, you have something much more powerful at your disposal, as you point out, or you can then explore where this will lead you. So I understand better, and it's why Newton call, does not call them laws. He says axioms. It's, yeah. He's too sophisticated to, to use axioms not for nothing. It's yeah. because he believes that at that point, if you get to them, they cannot be changed. They will not. You rule out. Yeah, and because because he has done for mechanics what Euclid has done for measure for 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 space spatial measurement, quite so. Again, there you see it's something else. The the same thing. So we can I can measure this by measuring this and then then doing some kind of operations. But I can also systematize this. I can see all all measurement operations can be systematized in this way. Let's assume these as actions, these as postulates, and then check. Okay. And that's what Newton sees himself as having done for mechanics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions?